Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the panel discussion this evening, where we'll be discussing long-term planning to deal with drought and flooding. Uh, my name is Chloe McKee, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb. And tonight, I'm joined by my colleague, Phil Bicknell. Phil works in our market intelligence team at AHDB. And we'll be leading the discussion this evening. We're also joined by Ian Baggs, who's a dairy farmer from Dorset. Liz Janova, independent sheep and beef consultant. And uh, last but not least, William Howe, Managing Director of Thorpe Farming Limited from Lincolnshire. So the plan of action this evening is that we'll kick off with a quick poll, and then we'll hear a series of short presentations from our speakers, followed by a panel discussion and Q&A for the majority of the webinar. Please ask questions um, as we go along. You can type these in at any time. Um, if you think of a question, type it in using the questions box, which usually sits on the right hand side of your screen. If you can't see this box, you may need, may need to click on the orange arrow to open up your control panel, um, scroll down to the questions box and click a little drop down arrow and you'll see where to type your question in. As usual, you will all be muted throughout the webinar. Um, so please all you also use this box to let us know if you're having any technical problems and I'll do my best um, to help. The usual advice is to log out and come back in. Um, so Phil, I'll, I'll hand over to you to introduce this evening's discussion. Thanks, Chloe, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I suppose, look, if only we could control the weather. I'm sure we've all thought it, and chances are we've been thinking about it a lot more often in recent years, uh, but we can't, and the, the reality is we have to plan for it. Um, so look, the, the day job for me is, uh, is heading up the market intelligence team at AHDB, and we routinely look at the impacts of weather on supply, demand, and on markets. But with 30-odd beef cattle that currently have very little grass, I've found myself faced by the practical implications of weather too. Um, the day job means that I like numbers and evidence. And if we look back to the last 100 years, seven of the 10 wettest years have occurred since 2000. But if we look at the warmest years, all 10 of the top 10 have occurred since 2000. And yeah, I think as, uh, as probably other panelists will feel, it's, uh, it's either, either we get no rain or we get a deluge. It's, uh, there's nothing in between. We've got a lot of data on the HDB weatherhood and weather hub. And I must admit that when it comes to extremes, I've delved back into the data to try and look for some of the parallel years. So the dry spring that we had this time last year had me looking back to 1991, what happened then, for example. Uh, this year, of course, I'm just thinking we're having a bit of an action replay of where we were 12 months ago, with it being so dry and, uh, and grass growth uh, being really slow to start. Now, from my perspective, I think knowing the kind of situation you're facing potentially helps and having alternative plans up your sleeve and at least thinking through the alternatives is a benefit. And I think that the earlier that we consider the alternatives, the more options that we have. And I think back to 2018 and the drought there and some of the, the big limitations that, uh, that were faced due to the timing of that, the options for me were, were really limited. And that's the point to doing this, uh, this webinar and, uh, and having our speakers at this time of the year. We honestly weren't expecting it, it to be so dry so early. I'm really glad that we've got uh, speakers with us today. Um, and particularly, I should mention Liz. Um, Talking to Liz was actually a bit of an epiphany for me on a couple of occasions. First up, she got me thinking much more about dry matter terms when it comes to planning feed requirements in a lot more detail. That was on the back of drought 2018 and trying to think through some of the feed alternatives. And I say detail, actually, it was a kind of simple spreadsheet that you can still find on the HDB website, but it certainly helped me with mapping contingencies. Now, I think it's fair to say we all thought of 1920 as exceptional. And certainly I used that as the upper limit when it came to planning this time last year. The reality is for me that cattle have been housed just as long this winter. Second bit that kind of, uh, kind of Liz has been involved with uh, for kind of helping me as well was in terms of rotational grazing. And that was a HDB grazing event back in spring 2019. Um, I know some folks are really evangelical about rotational grazing. I don't think I'm in that category, but I did make a start of breaking down fields into paddocks that year and continued it through 2020. And certainly if I'd have stuck with set stocking, I'd have been short of forage this winter and I've been having to buy it in. Um, look, but before we hear from, uh, from Liz, we're gonna hear uh, from uh, Will. Uh, but first of all, um, Ian is gonna kick us off. But before we do that, Chloe, we've got a quick poll. Uh, so if you could uh, pop that on the screen and, um, Quite simply, uh, we 
just after your views uh, about concerns right now about uh, grass. And I certainly know um, know that uh, yeah, my answer my answer is the second one on that list. Um, uh, certainly, kind of hoping grass takes off soon. Uh, forage stocks were were pretty short through uh, through last winter, so interested to uh, to get your views on that. Just give everybody a minute to uh, vote. I can see the votes coming in now quickly, so we're nearly there. Brilliant. Keen to know where people are. Great. Okay. So I'm not alone. I think I take from that. So thank you, Chloe. And uh, certainly, uh, yeah, that fourth option. Uh, didn't expect that to to uh, be at all popular. So um, thank you for that. Then. That gives us a gives us a, a, a kind of a heads up of kind of where we are um, and uh, and some of our concerns. But look, I'll hand over to uh, to Ian now, who's a dairy farmer in Dorset. And uh, just speaking before we started, um, I know he's in that similar category where uh, where grass growth has obviously been a uh, a key concern this spring. But Ian, over to you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I've got to share my screen, or is that already sharing, uh, Chloe? Um, not at the moment, Ian. How about now? Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Great. Here we go. Right. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, and I, the first thing I want to say is I'm I'm a novice. I'm no expert. I'm just an ordinary uh, dairy farmer, and possibly not even a good one at that. But um, I, uh, I guess I was asked to speak because I'm doing a Nuffield scholarship, uh, very generously sponsored by the Trahane Trust into sustainable forage cropping. And what drove me to investigate that topic, I make no bones about it, this is business critical to me. I'm in a very dry area, uh, or I'm supposed to get 30 inches of rain a year, but I get it pretty much all in the winter, very little in spring and summer. I've completely given up on spring reseeds because they fail. You can see here a photo of my cows, uh, got them out the earliest ever this year, 27th of February, a record for us because it was that dry and it's still dry, it hasn't rained since. I was really pleased but it turns out now I'm running out of grass, so um, it's, a, it's a challenge to manage. Um, now, uh, one of the aspects that makes things difficult is the rainfall, the other aspect for us is that half the farm is in floodplain and half the farm is sort of river gra gravel terraces and very sandy soils so i find i've got extremely drought flood prone land in summer the high ground and then the low grounds underwater in winter so definitely a challenge um particularly the high ground because this is what we think of as the better quality land this photo is quite indicative of uh what we do and what we've been driven to do by the climber and the soil type on the left you can see a rye grass and white clover lay from summer 2020 that's after 40 plus days nothing more than a few seed heads the rye grass dying out where it's got such shallow root depth uh, the clover does survive but very little volume on the right hand side you can see a maize crop on uh, the adjacent field even a drier field i do admit it's not the most fantastic crop you've ever seen but it is a crop and it beats the rye grass hands down for yield when we talk, to, talk about silage cuts, if I'm lucky, I might get five bales to the acre on a first cut. Other people will get 10 or 12. And uh, we're all, we all have the same milk price. So I've got a more acute challenge. So this is why we've been driven towards May. So talking about that, historically, what have we done? With flooding, we've done what we can to maintain our ditches, um, to try to keep the land as free as we can of flood water. And we've also accepted I don't want to call it defeat, but accepted that lower input farming is a way to go and stewardship has been very helpful with that. But there's very, I feel more limited what I can do about flooding than drought. Drought, we've moved towards growing maize, uh, which seems to have fantastic and reliable yields. We buffer feed hard throughout the year and especially in summer. And we will only do a grass reseed in autumn. I did dabble with a spring reseed last year and it failed. So back to strictly autumn sowing grass seed. So that's what we have done and it's 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 okay but we need to do better and the climate events are going to become more extreme and i hope to learn more from the other panelists today and throughout the sort of investigations i'm going to do in the future but 
the question perhaps for today or what I wanted to showcase is just a few things that I'm trialing to try to improve our, our drought resilience, our climate resilience. And the first thing to say here, I haven't put photos of all these bullet points, but infrastructure is critical. If you've got tracks and you've got good troughs, then you can perhaps take advantage of that shoulder season grazing and get out earlier in the spring and later in the autumn when perhaps you're more likely to have that moisture. So that's really important. And of course, fences for rotational or other types of grazing management, all critical. So they, they do matter and we're, we're trying to do more and more of those. Second point, purple lays for deep roots and nitrogen fixation, reduce fertilizer use. But the key thing, get that root depth. So I read a book, uh, you can see a picture of Robert uh, Elliott, who wrote a book about the Clifton Park system of farming back in the 1800s, read that with great interest. Um, made a mix. It's got foxfoot, it's got perennial ryegrass, it's got uh, festilolium's, clovers, red and white, sampoin, sheep's burnet, plantain, chicory, and I've sown it and I'm just seeing what seems to take, what seems to perform, monitoring it and deciding as evolving the mixes that are most appropriate for my conditions. So hopefully they'll help get those root, get that root depth and also build, build some organic matter. Uh, next point, grazing management. This was touched on um, previously. Uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, by by Phil. Uh, I think it is important. I'm not saying rotational is 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 uh, most appropriate for every, everybody's situation. People think rotational talk about a 21 day day rotation or grazing at covers of 3,000 down to 1,500 kilos of dry matter a hectare. I'm not sure that necessarily works for me with rye grasses heading at two, two and a half thousand kilograms dry matter perhaps, but the point is it must be managed appropriate for the lays you've got. Cow breeding. I hadn't appreciated how important this could be. So for example, this is a bull proof for a bull that I bought some straws of complex. And uh, just uh, I've just picked out here, body condition slightly above average, maintenance minus 18 kilos, stature short, because if I'm short of food, if I can get a really efficient animal at converting feed to milk or milk solids, that's got to be a good thing for my farm. And I've got quite a range of sizes with my cows. So I'm looking to bring more consistency and perhaps bring the maintenance requirements down slightly. So I'm less stressed on forage. Potentially calving pattern. I'm certainly looking to avoid summertime carvings because they're so hot and dry. Looking to go more of an autumn focus and potentially a spring focus. But certainly autumn, I think, is for a, for a dry farm like mine where it's at, because you house the cows over winter, you can manage their intakes. And then spring, they can really, uh, you can drive good residuals from your grazing platform without worrying too much about um, what you're doing for the cows' energy intakes so much, because they're staler. And um, the final point, sorry to run through these so quickly, but soil health, um, this is, um, uh, so I've got some examples of things I do. I've covered, I now cover crop after maize. It might be a forage rape or a mustard, or it might be a Westerwolds ryegrass, just to try to bind that soil together and hopefully retain some organic matter that can get, get plowed back in later in the, the following spring if it's a continuous maize field. Tillage wise, I've trialed establishing grassland without plowing because the moment you plow and cultivate, you puff up that soil, you lose that moisture. So a Dyna drive is a good, cheap, alternative effective tool. I'm sure there are others on the market. And also, back to grazing management, I've just got a couple of photos here of something I've tried on a single field. Um, the cows are very densely stocked. It's mob grazing. I'm not an expert. I'm not a proponent. I'm just experimenting here. High cover grazing, so that means a lot of grass on the field and putting a lot of cows in a small area. Uh, leaving residuals that hopefully go back into the soil and raise organic matter. I don't know how it's going to work, but my point is here. I haven't got the answers, but I'm trying different things to become more drought resilient. And that's really the message here. Try different things and see what works for you is the only advice I could really offer. So that's my experience and my little talk. Thanks for listening. And I'll stop sharing. Great. Many, many thanks, Ian. I think uh, we were saying before the start as well, uh, you know, kind of, Every day is a school day, effectively, isn't it? And uh, no matter how long uh, you know you've had cattle, it's always uh, it, it's always a learning experience. And particularly, I guess, with the the challenging conditions we've had in the last kind of three or four years, 
um, experimenting with something new is something that a lot more of us are always doing. Um, many thanks for that. Will, I'll hand over to you. So, Will, you're, uh, you're up in Lincolnshire, beef and arable, uh, but yeah, give us a, a bit more about uh, your, uh, your experiences and what you're doing. Will, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are farming 550 hectares uh, in sort of East Lincolnshire, um, predominantly where it's a very arable area, very heavy land, 65% clay, uh, which in itself isn't actually a bad thing. Uh, my issues come from the silt content, which means it doesn't uh, self struct brilliantly. And back in 2009, we were doing a conventional wheat rate rotation and uh, it was extraordinarily dry. We had a wet early summer, very dry, sort of early autumn, if you like. And I spent the entire time chasing clods up and down the field, backwards and forwards, thinking I was doing a lot of good. Uh, and I wasn't. And uh, at that stage, I thought, right, we've got to start doing things differently. And with the advent of the Aussie Drake came black grass, which then brought about a lot of spring cropping. This is not spring cropping land. Uh, in the slightest. We spend all winter trying to get rid of water and then we spend all summer trying to find it again. Uh, we average sort of 24 inches a year, sort of two inches a month as an average. But our rainfall seems to have gone, the pattern in any way has gone, we either get 10 mil a month, we get 100 mil a month, we don't get a lot different. What we've done, we've redrained 80% of the farm, 90% of the farm, Last 10 years. Uh, and with the demise of oilseed rape as a commercial crop because of the flea beetle, uh, I need a way of getting my soil in better condition so it holds on to the moisture longer. Uh, we can go from having puddles in fields to concrete within two to three weeks. So, and in order to keep on top of the black grass, I need spring crops. I've got to find a way of growing spring crops. So, hence we decided on grass and cattle and uh, very unusual for this area. In fact, I don't have any locally. Uh, there's not a fence between me and the wash. So we thought we'd have a go. So we've put in some uh, perennial ryegrass, red clover mixes with some chicory. So I, I was adamant when I was speaking to the seed merchant, I want something deep rooted because I view the cattle like I view a combine harvester. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what size they are. They're just there to harvest the grass. And a slightly moot point is the grass is running out, but that's just a discussion for a minute or two. So what we're doing, we've bought, we're, we're buying in sort of weaned calves with a view to taking through to heavy stores. And as you can see in this first picture, this is taken this spring. I've got loads of grass, haven't I? Apart from now, it looks white. And what's left also looks purple. Uh, so this photo was taken three months ago. That's three months, sorry, three weeks ago. And what we're doing, we are uh, rotational grazing, uh, which I find fascinating. It's such a simple thing, but uh, it does require a little bit of thought and effort. And they are currently getting, uh, I've got 130 in the mob now, and they're getting just short of a hectare a day. Uh, I can't give you the exact kilos of dry matter, simply because there's so much spring wheat in there, it wouldn't be a tree read, true reading. So, but they're they're taking it down well, uh, but with this dry weather, it's just not coming back. Uh, Chloe, could we have the next slide? So, uh, the biggest problem we have here is we have no facility to, uh, no sheds, nowhere to put cattle in the winter. We have to out winter. Uh, this was done at home on my little bit of light land I have, but that's all I have. Uh, and the system we're aiming for is something which is 100% forage fed and 100% grazed. I don't want to use plastic and I don't want to use diesel. Uh, if we keep getting these uh, dry springs, I was worried I might have to buffer feed in July and August, not in April, but we'll wait and see. So this was a West World Brassica mix we put in, which uh, we found uh, I was uh, yeah, the, the dream chap for a salesman. It's got far too much grass and it's got far too much brassica and they outcompeted one another. But it did a job for this year. The cattle gained 1.1 kilos a day 
on this mix. Then Chloe, could we again, please? And then, so this is what I'd call a black sort of humic sand. This is not traditional for my farm. I just have one little bit of it. But you can see from this, this is how we sort of monitor the soil. I dig a hole, I count the worms. I'm aiming for 20 per spade tree, but we, we're five to 15 more on this land. It's high organic matter. And you can just see the hoof print at the top of that profile. And that just shows that the compaction from the cattle has actually only gone in two inches or so. Which with the drilling setup we have, I can get beneath that and through that into the um, that soil there. If this particular soil type is not got a cover of residue or a crop on it, it will blow away. Uh, next door, they actually got it into potatoes for our reason at the moment, and it's it will just blow the first gust of wind. Uh, yes, please. This little is the other extreme when you try and out winter on land that's not suitable for it. So this was the other end of the same field, more traditional to what I've got. Uh, this was beginning of January. We had 50% of our annual rainfall in 10 weeks. Um, and it just got to the point whereby they hadn't got anywhere dry to lie. Uh, so fortunately, with the system I've got, I can just run them up the side of the field and allocate another pattern. But it's all work and effort. This land hasn't recovered. I've drilled it with spring beans, but uh, I decided not to subsoil it. I don't want to lose the moisture. And just at the minute, we're just so short of moisture. We rely on the easterly wind here to dry us out in the spring, but we like it to stop. Uh, and it hasn't done so far. And it's just having all the moisture as we go. During the winter, we were moving them uh, twice a day. So they got fresh feed twice a day, which I think is pretty attributable to the growth rates we've got. Uh, but I was very adamant they had to have a dry light and I don't like the mess. This, this to me is not a success, this particular part of the field. So this was a little bit earlier in the winter and it's just proving what's possible. We had 23 mil of rain which is on the, the the slightly more churned up side, if you like. But the next day, they had a half day break and it was as clean as a whistle. So it can be done, but the, the attention to detail and just keeping the cattle moving, don't let them stay anywhere for too long, will hopefully mean that the cattle become a viable option as a break. They, the, the recycling of the nutrients how I can fit them in. I am growing cover crops on the rest of the farm, but being an all arable farm, trying to get the water to the right place, the fences to the right place, not too many energizers, uh, is a logistical nightmare really. But they, they, can, they can recycle the nutrients and my big problem when trying direct drilling has been slugs on the heavier land. I'm hoping with the hoof action, that should sort out some of the slug egg, egg issues that we have should in turn mean I can direct drill, should in turn improve the soil, hold on to the water for longer and actually drain better during the winter. We, we do soil test, although I'm not a massive fan of the traditional type. Uh, we look more at the um, cation exchange type um, tests just to try and identify issues. Uh, we don't do blanket areas, but we do do um, areas where we where we can see we've got a problem because the soil changes so much across the farm um, and across each field that it's hard to just take one single test. That is a very brief overview of what we're doing uh, and uh, if there's going to be any questions please fire away in a little while. Thank you. Great, many thanks. Uh, many thanks, Coffee. Will. And um, yeah, a reminder to uh, to keep the uh, uh, to drop your questions into the question box, and uh, we'll pick them up um, uh, after we've heard from Liz. So, Liz, we'll uh, we'll hand over to you. And uh, so, you're a your consultant um, on the on the grading side. So, uh, over to you for uh, for thoughts from uh, from your perspective about longer longer term planning on the grazing side. Yeah, and I think. 
um, I'm just briefly going to just talk a bit about sort of climate change mitigation and adaptation. So this is sort of the official phrases of what we're going to talk about. And mitigation is the element about reducing emissions and, and increasing sink. So storage and generally that's carbon storage on farm really. Um, and so in a lot of the systems I'm working with now is that carbon reduction, all of a sudden in the last 12 months, we're looking at ways on farm of trying to reduce inputs. The challenge is uh, when you speak to feed companies, they are selling more feed this month than they did in February. So this is it's not part of this is about we can't we have to be flexible in terms of our approaches to buying in various inputs. But our long term plan is to try and reduce the sort of inputs coming to the farm and, and reducing carbon footprinting of ruminant production. A lot easier said than done, I accept. But I we have to talk a bit about the sort of mitigation element and from a methane perspective between big ticket item for ruminants in terms of efficiency so we're looking fertility growth rates and again the growth rate performance you know, the those cattle on an outwintering system at wills was you know, is incredibly good for that time of year um, if we look at nitrous oxide so again a really important source of greenhouse gases we're looking at soil and manure management so again big part of within beef and dairy systems um, and then again, CO2, so looking at fuel use, energy, and again, Will's point in terms of trying on his farm to not really use any plastics, doing generally reducing those inputs that it's a grazed only system. So it's about that sort of the long term vision of those farms, plus in the situation we're in at the moment, which is actually how do we get through the next few weeks? And those plans have to evolve and we'll, we'll, we'll come up to some of that. In, so cover some of that in the questions later on. Um, so from an adaptation perspective, so these resilient systems that we've talked about, and again, we've heard of these, the two, um, both me and Will, in terms of designing these systems to achieve these bigger aims than, than necessary just milk or meat production. So it all, the conversation always starts with soil health. So we're thinking, traditionally, we generally think of, about organic matter, we think structure, and we're very much now thinking more about biology and getting that soil biology to work for us. So we have to, so we reduce the chemical inputs that we can apply. Um, so it is, and there's been a lot of interest and a lot of tools, and certainly HDB has got some great information about looking at soil health and, us, and understanding where those soils are. And the challenge for both the systems we've heard about is that they're quite early in this transition phase. So are the soils quite ready for what they're being asked to do? And I think that's that's in certain systems, the soils, it does take five, ten years for those soils to make significant change in terms of become more resilient in inverted commas. Um, and both of them sort of touched on rotational grazing and why we like rotational grazing is uh, fundamentally it grows more grass and it also improves utilization so when we're planning feed on farm it gives us more control about how we allocate that feed back to stock um, because we're not grazing up a portion of the farm we can measure it and get an idea of growth rates and so it just allows us to have a better understanding of what's going on on farm and the a lot of the work I do is on feed planning with farmers so looking at sort of in early spring and autumn trying to get a feed plan established for that farm and as a sort of an overview have we got enough feed to keep the stock that we want to keep and what I've said before is that most of the time we would buy silage in from 100 miles away versus sell stock and sometimes um, we have to design our business to to have a tradable element so as will said he ha he can he might not like them very much but he can he can remove a class of stock off his farm and, and sell them a strong stores if he needs to and if grass and so it, it is about having a flex in that system to allow you to to move and it's um again easier said than done but it to have just 100 percent breeding stock is a really challenging system to manage on a grass and forage grazed system only. Um, we've also got to think, and there's some the various debates about shelter and shade. So again, if we think adaptation, we're getting more extreme wind events, sun events, all of those. So actually, how can we design our farm and using some of the environmental scheme options that are available to actually build in shade shelter belts um, and how 
um, we can see from an agroforestry perspective, it was always a bit of on, on a niche end, but actually there's a lot more interest in it and how, how could it be built in. And certainly it's one of the targets from a, from a government policy perspective to build more of those systems in. And for someone who's used to grazing stock in parkland, I don't think it's very new, grazing sheep around trees, but again, it's, it's, it's working out how they can fit into systems. So, do you mean Will, for example, do you your in in Will's system, doing your grazing arable farms, that the shelter is could be a concern in the future. But I don't know what are options in terms of building that into longer term environment schemes. But again, it's this idea that with short term issues in the in the last few months versus the long term plan for the farm. Um, animal selection again was talked about. Ian and I'm not saying we all have to go out and buy a black, Barbados black belly sheep. We have a range of breeds within the UK that can deal with with this with the temperatures we're likely to get. And what we know is that we have to select for animals that do well in our systems. Um, we have to remember that it's not always very dry or very wet. And so, but we can use the animals that we got we have already got and select them well to achieve what they need to. And and sometimes it is a breed substitution. Sometimes it's selecting within a, within a breed, but it's having a clear idea of what do those animals need to do and, and perform on your farm. And Ian's talked a bit about crop selection, but um, there is a massive variety of different crops out there that ruminants can utilise. Um, we have probably been pigeonholed slightly into a ryegrass white clover sward, and on certain farms in certain situations, you you cannot find anything that beats it. On more marginal areas, be that dry, be that cold, be that wet, there are other varieties of grasses and other plants that can do a better job. Um, and it's sort of trying to find what that mosaic is um, that fits farms. And a part of it is that we don't really, my main plea is that we don't do systems research. We tend to investigate one thing and we see how things grow. And actually we're trying to understand how it fits together to to provide enough grass forage to support the ruminants over a year, basically. Um, we don't always have the right information to make all of those decisions. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, we've got a couple of questions that are coming. I'll come into those in a moment, but uh, please, um, please kind of chip in with more questions. But Liz, before we were having a chat before uh, uh, before the webinar kicked off, you. Um, uh, I know kind of earlier today you were you doing a session where you were looking about um, you know, what does the what does kind of beef production start to look like in 10 years time but you know, how, how top of mind is the is the climate uh, impact and the changes that we're seeing um, is, is that is that top of the list when it comes to the challenges or uh, or is it is it just not the forefront I think it's part of it because the advantage we really have when a lot of there's been a lot of interest and focus on on gray systems on bringing on increasing utilization and grass and forage and it is a very noble endeavor but springs like this spring really starts to challenge people's confidence in what can and can't happen in those systems um and as i mentioned there isn't there isn't any judgment in having to bring in supplementation to keep those animals on farm it's it but it's trying to work out if it's every year and the same pattern is occurring, something needs to shift in that system. The stocking needs to change. The I mean, so it's about it's not just keep fighting it because it will it will it has to work. Sometimes you've also got to just tweak things and realise that actually there's there might there has to be a different way of doing it because um, it. But what we can see within within the UK is that yes, I know we have the extremes. We're talking about this very dry spring. But there's ruminant sectors in more extreme places of this world that we can learn from. So we're in quite a nice place, really, that we 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 can learn from lots of different countries and how they do it. And part of it is challenging that we can't just carve at the time of year we want to carve. It's about how do we fit better with what our farm can grow and when it can grow it. Okay. So it's very, very much kind of adapting. And I suppose the kind of I guess as I was thinking, what what was what was the exception? It all feels like it's becoming the norm now, and that makes some of that planning just even even harder than it uh, it was previously. Um, this question will, and I think I know the answer to this, but um, just uh, a comment about uh, you know, have you got any woodland to put cattle in on a really rainy day that has pre-stock fodder in? Uh, and that's from John Thorns, who's uh, who said that kind of he really finds that um, 
putting them in, in woodland for a handful of days a year really helps. But uh, I guess based on the location, I, I suspect I might know the answer to this. I do have woods. Uh, they tend to be underwater during the winter. Uh, so no, they, the cattle were out there to fend for themselves. They they had a hedge in part of the field, but that was it. We don't have hedges in the main. We just have uh, ditches. Um, so and yeah, uh, I, I'm old school. I think the cattle in the fresh air are far healthier than being indoors. Uh, the air was quite fresh on one or two days, but that was fine. That wasn't an issue. Um, I, the, one of my woods I could get cattle to, but getting them there, you know, it's it's a, over a kilometre when I have no infrastructure, so it's not really doable. And what about the, I suppose, thinking about some of the long term, and um, I suppose when I look at where where we're heading in terms of the the policy aspect and more for the, the public money, public goods, the environmental focus that comes with it. I know we're kind of very much at that test stage and piloting things, but would, if the incentives were right, would you be looking at adding, um, you know, kind of more more hedges? Would you be trying to look at uh, adding woodland for the long term? Uh, not woodland. Uh, shelter belts, possibly. Uh, I have to be very careful because of my land drainage, uh, so I can't just start going sticking trees here, there, and everywhere. Uh, because I need the without the land drainage, I'll turn back to a marsh again. Uh, yeah. So that there are places I could have a shelter belt, but when the fields are best part of a kilometre long, shelter belt doesn't do a huge amount of good. And, and I think I, part sorry, I was the one who started that conversation, and I think part of it is having the right cattle as well, isn't it? So you've more native types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And acclimatised to that. Yeah, very much. We, we won't have a continental on the farm. Uh, it's got to be native, so it's suited to that system. And uh, the, one of the problems with the elms going forward is sort of what I'd describe as a commercial arable farm. Uh, elms isn't really catering for that. I, I'd agree with um, uh, both Liz and Will. I think actually we can be guilty of molly coddling stock and um it's amazing what they can do as long as they've got the right nutrition it's amazing what they can do certainly gay brown um uh us farmer um or, uh he's posted some photos of cattle in really tremendous snow conditions withstanding it and these are forage fed cattle and it really is quite incredible uh i get there's also a public image aspect to this that the consumer wants to see cattle looking comfortable and used to seeing the country's country file image of uh, cattle in winter in a nice nicely strawed up barn but the right animals with the right nutrition can can handle some pretty adverse conditions so they're quite incredible animals Ian, you mentioned about the, the kind of investment side that you're doing in terms of the farm infrastructure and and tracks and troughs and and fences so how is that is that kind of a multi-year plan? Have you got mapped out what you're going to do for the next kind of four or five years? Because I guess when I think about when I bring cattle in here, it's because the gateways have just got a real state, and um, yeah, that, that's the that's the kind of aspect for me. The farm will never be done. It will never be done. So yes, it's, it's an ongoing thing. To pick up on what Liz said about thinking more about long-term planning, it's a small thing, but we ripped off some cladding, put on space boarding and a couple of big ventilated fans for our cubicle house, and it's made a real difference in summer. It wasn't a massive spend, but it, it really does make it make a difference in that hot dry time. Um, yeah, absolutely tracks. You've got if you've got grass, sometimes you've got grass, but you've got to get to it. And especially in the dairy situation, they have to walk to a fresh break to, or they, to the field at least four times a day, twice out and twice back for milking, um, assuming you're on a twice a day system. And so, yeah, you, you, you've got to have that infrastructure. You need the water troughs where that you want the cattle to be so they're not traveling long distances. So sometimes it is small things. Um, you know, 100 quid's worth of poly pipe and an extra trough, uh, you know, can just make that difference. Just make it that little bit easier. And also, um, I, I, I know exactly what Will's talking about, about lugging round energizers and car batteries and, um, yeah, being fed up because it's all so hard. 
if you can find ways to make it easy, uh, do it. And and a top tip for me, solar powered energizers. If you haven't got mains electric around the farm, brilliant things, brilliant things. A couple of hundred quid, but they'll save you messing up so many batteries, and they're light. And you can carry them with one hand. I've written that down. The, the other bit, I'm like, kind of, I'm always amazed at how many steps I do, um, or how much distance you travel, uh, putting up a couple hundred meters of uh, electric fencing. Yeah, and don't forget three to one geared reels. I bought a load of cheap reels because they were online on offer and they weren't geared, and I regret it. See, there is an advantage of it being in a sunny farm. Lots of solar solar energy, you see, for your yeah. electric fence. Um, what I forgot to mention earlier was also there's um, a bit of interest recently in mob grazing systems, whereas you're building up this this bulk of forage before you're, you're sort of grazing at quite high stocking rates. And what's intriguing about I'm not saying that we're at that extreme, but most of those systems have been have come from countries with um, where grass growth is limited to a certain period of the year because of either very cold or very dry. So in a lot of places they're moving to more mob grazing type approaches just because you're building up a bulk when you can and then you sort of slowly allocate it back um it's probably more applicable to some beef systems and dairy but there's some interesting dairy systems also going down that route and liz have we has there much research on sheep in the mob grazing systems um there's bits the challenge we so, well certainly we know that sheep do very well or wean lambs do incredibly well on sort of longer clover type herbal lays when they're allowed to choose the best bits um there's sometimes a debate about um quality so the and the key with a lot of it is that it needs to be a not a perennial ryegrass dominated sward because as ian mentioned ryegrass just goes to head too quick so it loses quality too quick so you, it is about site selection and, and and lay really on or whether you've got those diverse mixes already on the farm but they, it can work well but you it's always this trade-off between you can probably get better live weight gain performance on different lays but if you're in a situation where you can't re reliably grow those lays in that sort of more conventional that to that to that then they'll do well on the mob grazing approach or tall, it's a tall grass grazing approach is also an, another phrase is used I'm talking of sheep, there's a question that came in for Will, and uh, Will, have you considered using sheep as a forage harvester instead of cattle? Uh, yes, they were my first choice actually, uh, but I uh, put it, I was never going to have anything to do with them, I was just going to grow the grass for them, uh, I don't like sheep, uh, but they, they would actually probably be more applicable in my situation, uh, simply because they're just a bit kinder to the land. They're not my area of expertise. Either account. What breeds are you using, Will? Sorry, I shouldn't be asking questions, but I'm keen to. Uh, uh, where Angus crosses uh, in the main. I've got some beef shorthorn crosses, but and uh, I've been trying to buy them crossed with the um, sort of New Zealand Frisian, Irish Frisian type. I've, whole time I've got a few of them, uh, and they're just a bit too leggy. Mm. Uh, I, I want to have a great big round belly that converts forage, and it, it's plain to see when, when you get them side by side. It's plain to see. What and I, I, certainly on the breeding, I, I you can absolutely see a difference, and it, it sounds too obvious to almost mention in this forum. But um, if I compare the whole, how the Holstein steers perform on relatively rough ground, marginal grazing, floodplain you know, that's uh, during the summertime grazing, the Herefords really flesh up nicely, very blocky animals. So where you've got that marginal land, the right species, the right the right variety of, 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 of stock is, um, yeah, absolutely a game changer. Yeah, and there's yeah. A, a kind of comment that came in saying about almost the, um, you know, farm the, farm the geography you have, not the geography that you wish you had. And I suppose it's the, yeah, it's that point there. Um, well, kind of, I'm, I'm interested, so obviously the, the cattle are, are relatively new on, on farm, uh, but I suppose what's the what's the timeline that you're giving it in terms of trying to see that you know that positive impact overall on the on the farming business? Because presumably you know you you want it to fit as part of that uh, 
uh, the, the arable enterprise. And I guess I've, I've then got another probably a cheeky question, I suppose, is the uh, what, what's your, your kind of assumption that you've made in terms of the business planning in relation to prices when uh, when you went into this? Prices have gone the right way, but uh, unfortunately, so is the calf price. So the bit in the middle hasn't changed a huge deal. Uh, and in terms of seeing a benefit, we, we are a, a six year rotation. And so with the grass here, I've extended that with the grass, I've extended that to seven years. Uh, unfortunately, at this rate, I'm only probably going to see the cows go around the farm once before uh, I'm ready for retirement. Um, but we should be able to see after the two years a difference in the following wheat crop. That is the plan. Uh, at the minute, we're hoping to direct drill that wheat crop, but we'll wait and see. Uh, but that, that that is the plan. But I know with only a, a two year sort of clover grass type break, the best I can get out of that before you see a sort of diminishing quality to your soil again will probably be only four or five years. I think you see uh, a marked improvement. I'd have to have the grass in for four or five years and then perhaps only have three or four cereal and then back into grass. But I've got a very anxious bank manager. Great, thank you. Um... Liz, can you you mentioned about the um, the environmental schemes and taking advantage of uh, of uh, potentially potentially some of what that may have to offer? Um, I suppose I'm I'm conscious that as much as we focus on the environmental aspect, there's also funding that goes into the productivity related measures, and again, that feels like there's there's more testing and piloting to come. So, if you were trying to combine the you had that fast that hotline into DEFRA to be able to say, right, this is what would help from a productivity perspective in terms of grants and support. What would be on your list? Thank you for that. Um, um, now, in terms of uh, in terms of what are the major drivers in terms of pro productivity on farm, and so there is questions around stocking rate and fertility of those and performance so it's it's trying to get an idea of all of those a lot of the time a lot of that information is available on farm sometimes it's collected sometimes it's analyzed sometimes it's acted upon so I am unfortunately not going to say it's going to be a magic wake rate because I've seen enough situations where wake rates go on farm and they're just not used so I think it's more to do with the more emotional support of farmers, which is actually the support network around them, around a farm team approach, um, actually getting the data that already exists used before we start creating a longer list of jobs. Um, I've seen a lot of examples of data fatigue where lots and lots of spreadsheets are generated and then not a lot is done with them. Um, and I, I don't mean to be, but that, do you, you see it on, what is our really clear vision for that farm and what are the handful it is literally handfuls of measures that we need to look at the challenge we've got is those handful of measures for each farm is a bit different so i can't say the top five kpis for the sheep industry are them i just because for each farm it's got to be slightly different based on what their questions are um and i think the grazing the grazing i'm obviously obsessed with grass and forage but um we can encourage farmers to measure, but what we need them to do is to to use those informations to, to, to sorry to use those numbers to make different decisions. And I think that's the bit that we don't support enough is the is the decisions. And I'm not about decisions to support tools and lots of different uh, software programs. It's just conversations with others who are experienced or doing it. Could be other farms, could be WhatsApp groups. It's any of that that turn those numbers into action it's not more kit on farm most of the time yeah i mean that that's probably my take as well the the and it's probably a frustration i suppose that i've seen successive schemes where it's about the kit and how do i get you know match funding or tap into uh, the piece of kit that uh that ultimately sits there and isn't fully used and i suppose the 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 bit about how how does it actually change behaviour and how do you how do you make better decisions on the back of it is critical and um, I suppose the the smarter thing is how you start to tie that up with some sort of skills offer or some sort of group uh, support or discussion 
aspects that feels like it's a more sensible route to go if you're in charge of I guess the public funding. But it's easier to do you mean you can count the number of way crates you've got onto a farm? Do you mean as, as an outcome measure you can understand why people go that but it, I don't think it, sh it doesn't change behaviour on farm it just is easy metric to measure from a funder Ian, perspective. Ian, I'm what about your, sorry. <laughs> that's a loud. Ian, what about from your perspective if you were kind of in that, that kind of wish list for, for DEFRA of you know, anything under future farming policy that would help you? Uh, I, this is dodging the question but I probably wouldn't submit a wish list to DEFRA because I think it would get short shrift. However, um, what I will say is one of the most important things is, is knowledge, knowledge and it, the benefit of experience to other farmers. I make mistakes every year and I learn from them. But what's even better is if I can learn from somebody else's mistakes. And a great example of that for anybody who's listening and has drought prone soils and are interested in herbal lays, the AHDB did a really good series, three or four uh, online webinars about herbal lays one on establishment, one on grazing management, one on environmental benefits. And these were panelists of experts, farmers, farmer experts, talking about what they'd done. Do you plow or not? Do you direct drill or not? Should I sow chicory? Yes, or no. how do I raise it if I do? And that kind of stuff, it just gives farmers like me that confidence to say, you know what, I am gonna give this a go because what I'm doing isn't optimal it's not working as well as I would like it to. So I've got to change, I've got to evolve. Um, so yeah, my wish list probably, the, 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 the top of the list is just more pragmatic support, knowledge sharing. So basically mimicking what Liz said, it could be webinars, it could be discussion groups, it could be you know publications, whatever, but um, just get that knowledge out there, make people aware of it. Yeah, Chloe, I'm thinking that's probably about a, a, a nice introduction to that final, that second poll question, I think, isn't it? In terms yes. of in terms of kind of how we can help from a from an HDB angle. Yeah, that should be on your screens in a moment. And I suppose, yeah, we I <laughs> I can't put a wish list into DEFRA, but I think what we can do at HDB is um is try and think a little bit more about the uh the kind of uh, the kind of things that we can do to help, and I suppose again from personal experience, the 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 penny drop moment for me was being stood on a farm up in Cumbria uh, uh, with a, a group of other farmers talking about um, rotational grazing and how you make the switch to that, and uh, that for me feels like certainly it, it helped me, uh, and that feels like the kind of aspect we can come in. So we we'll just give you a couple more seconds to. Uh, say what you'd want from us but um, I guess uh, a, a, another plug again for some of the tools and resources that we've already got and we will uh, send uh, those out to you. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm making the assumption that uh, quite a few of you um, are signed up for the Forage for Knowledge uh, email that uh, goes out on a weekly basis and certainly checking grass growth and uh, uh, monitoring what's happening across the country might make us feel a little a little bit better. Um, so interesting to see the feedback there about um, I guess picking up some of the broadly what we do and it's it's not about the tools, it's about the exchange of new ideas and information. Um, more case studies, hearing from uh, other farmers like us um, and a little bit in terms of regional forage supplies. So thank you for that. We'll uh, we'll, we'll pick that up and um, we will uh, make sure that we're, we're trying to align what we do around our grazing and around our weather resource, that wider knowledge exchange offer um, with that. Um, I'm conscious of, uh, of time. Uh, I think we're, we're kind of heading towards the, uh, the end of the uh, allotted hour. Um, let me just double check on questions again. Um, and uh, John flagged, I guess, John, this is on the, the wish list. So he talks about a, you know, a European benchmarking group for beef farmers like we have for European dairy farmers. So I suppose that, that's looking at how we compare and, and measure up and learn. I suppose it, it's uh, the point that Ian was making, but also that Liz was making, that there are other parts of the world that are more drought stressed or deal with more, more extremes than us. So um, it's a case of not reinventing the wheel, but what can we learn from others and, uh, and how they perform. So. No, I think that's a, that's a sensible call. Um, 
so I was gonna I was gonna kind of uh, draw things to a close, but just hand over to the okay. panelists for a final word. So I can see Liz wanting to jump in. Um, no, no, it's just I'm I'm just conscious of um, just provide well my views in terms of in the next few months for people or weeks, sorry, if people are struggling for grass in terms of just things to think about. That's what we're also gonna mention. So Liz, if we if if we do that, but first of all, Ian and Will, if um, I'm kind of I'm kind of interested to hear what your plan B is. What's you know, if we get no rain for another two weeks, which certainly there's not a lot in the forecast uh, when I check for this part of the world. What's the plan? How are you going to how are you going to cope with that? And then we'll hear from Liz. Is that okay? Yeah. Shall I go first? Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Ian. You. So I've already secured a big pit of maize uh, from last year. It hurts cash flow, but it's there. I know I'm going to need it. Um, so yeah. You've got to ha you've got to you when you, we don't, as a dairy farmer, I don't have the facility to offload stock, sell them and buy them when I need. I've got to keep my stock uh, and I've got to keep them in rude health. So, yeah, got to have food in the bank. Okay, thanks. So, Ian, Will, what about your perspective? Uh, it depends. I've got enough silage left from the winter because I bought a little bit for the winter. I've got a little bit left. Depends how long it goes on for. If not, I'll start selling stock. I don't have a plan B. If I start having too big a contingency plan Bs, uh, it just messes the system up. I'm better to buy and sell stock as it's appropriate. That's right. So, so it's that point that, that Liz was making, I suppose, it's the flexibility. And I must admit, as we, uh, for me, as headed into, heading into the winter, I sold stock earlier than I normally would because I knew I was short of bedding and short of, uh, short of fodder. And I, I'm, you know, despite what's happened with prices, I'm kind of glad I did because it, it, it stacked up for me in terms of the margins at the time. So Liz, final, final word from you in terms of kind of uh, top tips for the for getting through the next few weeks and, and months with uh, with potentially some very dry conditions. And I think most of these tips are more applicable for beef and sheep because I do a bit less work with dairy and I agree that doing it's prior. So within beef and sheep systems, we can start to prioritise those stock classes a bit. So I would encourage everyone to sort of have a bit of a stock take in terms of what is out there from a pasture cover perspective. So how much grass is there? Um, and also in terms of your forage stocks. So if you've got silage, um, the key the key trigger points, particularly if you've got ewes and lambs grazing at the moment, is if you're under four centimetres in terms of saw height, so 1500, is they need some form of supplantation going in. And that could be a couple of hundred grams of concentrates. And that's just to maintain that early stage of lactation, which benefits uh, lamb growth and hopefully gets you into the six pounds a kilo section we're in at the moment. Um, again, if, you, if it's low again, uh, a forage needs to go in. Um, and again, cattle, um, I mean, there is that supplementation is generally needed if your recovery rate is dropping. So you're trying, to, as, as your grass growth slows, you're sl trying to slow down your rotation. And what that could mean is that, that you need to feed them and keep them in a field for a few more days than you would like. But what that's doing is trying to get the rest of the farm as much recovery as possible. So it is, it's, you're trying to in, ensure that the rest, it might sacrifice an area and the stock might not do as well as you would like, but it's about the greater good and the rest of the farm and you're trying to preserve it as much as possible. The challenge we've got at the moment is nitrogen applications. Some people have made them earlier, but because of the lack of warmth and now moisture, that response rate just isn't there. So you, it's so it does tend to fall back to supplementation ideally with silage if you've got it available concentrates if you need it but prioritize stock definitely thanks liz we've just had one question come in that i would like to sneak in um ian it might be one for you to kick off with why not graze silage and delay first cut uh, for me uh if i graze silage grant there will be no i might get one cut and that is it so that silage ground is precious because my winter ration is so maize heavy. I need to get I need to make sure I've got some clamped silage to get mix in that winter. But I absolutely agree. It's madness to feed grass silage and have a grass grazing field. If there's a logistical way to graze, um, then, then, then then do that instead of, um, as Will put it, uh, burning diesel and plastic uh, unnecessarily. So absolutely something to consider. 
Thanks, Ian. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for thanks for Liz. Thanks to Will. Thanks for Ian and Chloe. Thanks for uh, thanks for organising. And thanks to everyone for joining us as well. And thanks for the questions that have come in. Um, we'll follow up with uh, with an email after this to, to get your feedback, but we'll also flag uh, some of the HDB resources that uh, that we've got available. Um, so again, thank you for your time this evening. And uh, for, for the three of us, we'll certainly keep our fingers crossed for rain, I guess, in the next. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. It never it, works, though, does it? <laughs> but we'll do it. Thank you. Thanks. 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 thanks.